Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design, winter quarter 2009 version. Um, glad to see you all here. We've got a great la list of speakers already lined up, have the whole quarter scheduled, uh, and we'll be um, looking forward to having you here. Let me just do a few administrative things quickly since it's the beginning of the quarter. Can you focus down on, on that, please? So. There is a website for this course. It's one name is oh, you know what? I forgot. <laughs> I forgot to finish writing it. Slash. I'll give you the short version. CS five four seven. So it's on the HCI website and uh, CS five four seven. You will find there, among other things, um, all the abstracts for the talks that are coming up. So you can go if you want to know about what's happening which week and actually read the details on all the talks. We have one one abstract still to be filled in for later in the quarter, but the rest are all filled in. So uh, you can see what's coming up. Uh, there is an email list which send, we send out once a week the announcement of who will be speaking that week. I uh, usually send it out on Monday or Tuesday. So if you'd like to be reminded an email, you can sign up for it using the standard Stanford mailman system. It's called PCD-Seminar. Just a short word of explanation. When this was started uh, 15, no, 18, 19 years ago, um, it was called the Seminar on People, Computers, and Design, which is still how I introduce it. But when I got put into the catalog in order to fit the sequence of courses, it got called the HCI Seminar. So both those names refer to the same thing. Um, and uh, the mailing list is still uses the old name PCD, People, Computers, and Design. Um, I'm Terry Winograd in the Computer Science Department. And if you want to email me, it's winograd at cs.stanford.edu. Uh, and the course assistant for the course this quarter is Ranjitha Kumar, who uh, is a PhD student in CS, and she is Ranju at Stanford.edu. And if you have any questions, please send them along, and we'll be glad to answer. In order to get credit, uh, if you are signed up for this course for credit, you need to attend, hear all the lectures, and attend at least all but two of them in person. Uh, when we had, didn't have that requirement, we ended up with great speakers speaking to empty local audiences and then people watched it later. But it's really helpful to have questions, to have interaction. <laughs> so if you're taking it remote, if you're an SCPD student or something like that, you can watch them all online. But if you're a regular student and you don't have a specific course conflict, um, then you can miss two and make up online. Uh, anything, if there are any problems with that, please send email ahead of time. I'm much more sympathetic to somebody who says, I've already missed two and I've got a job interview coming up, than somebody who writes at the end of the quarter and says, oh, by the way, I missed three. So. Do, do be in touch. Um, no other requirements. At the end, we'll ask you to certify under the honor code that you actually have watched them all. No specific essays, hand-ins, exams, anything like that. Anybody who is not registered and doesn't want to register, that's great. Uh, you're welcome to come to any of them in person or watch them on the web. It's an open seminar for anybody. OK, I think that's all the administration for the quarter. Oh, yeah. The other thing is Ranjita is going to have a sign-up list to pass around every day. If you sign up, uh, thank you. If you sign up on the list as it goes by, you have done what you need to for that day. If you're here in person and you miss the list, send a note or try and catch. Come up the end of the, the end of the class, and it'll be up here front, and you can sign it. Okay, because we we m measure whether you've actually been here by whether you sign the sign up list. Thank you. Today, uh, one more just quick announcement. Now, next week we have Hayes Raffle, who. Uh, recently finished his PhD at the MIT Media Lab, working with Hiroshi Ishii and the Tangible Bits group. Um, and he's going to be speaking, he's now a researcher at Nokia Research here in Palo Alto, and is going to be speaking next Friday uh, on interest, oh, there he is, right there. Uh, say a word about your, your topic. Um, I'll be talking about a um, uh, construction kit called Topolo that I developed in collaboration with others and uh, specific for learning and design. So, so that's next week. Uh, for beyond that, take a look at the website. This week we have Todd Mowry, who is a visiting professor here this year on sabbatical from CMU, where he normally is. Uh, he was actually a grad student here. He did his PhD in the electrical engineering department uh, a few years ago. Uh, and 
has sort of shifted area. When he was here, he was working on multiprocessors and parallel programming and stuff like that. Uh, and that inspired him to think about, I guess, parallel physical stuff as opposed right. to parallel yeah. programs. Uh, so he'll be talking about what can you do if you actually try to build physical stuff that has parallel processing built in. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the, the thing I'll be talking about today is um, a, a technology that we call Pario. And uh, this is a project that uh, we started about five years ago at Carnegie Mellon. And then uh, four years ago, I took a small leave of absence to uh, run Intel's research lab on the CMU campus. And this also became a big project at that lab. So it's a joint project uh, between CMU and Intel. Um, and so originally, it was just uh, Seth Goldstein and myself. I guess I'm supposed to use this instead. Uh, and then we've convinced lots of other people to uh, work on this stuff, too. So I'll tell you about what it is. So a way to think about the, the motivation for this is, um, a way I like to think about it, is the thing that we call multimedia. Um, we all love multimedia. And multimedia usually is a shorthand for audio and video and maybe text also. And if we think about our favorite gadgets or the things we really want to go out and buy, there's a good chance that these things have some interesting multimedia part to it. So your iPhone or your iPod or your new HDTV or whatever it is. So, <clears throat> so why is it that multimedia is so compelling to us? So I think one of the reasons is that we can just appreciate it and experience it directly with our own senses. So we can see things, we can hear things, and so on. So, you know, grandma can enjoy it even if she doesn't know anything about technology. Um, and then in terms of how this gives us new capabilities, I think one uh, thing about multimedia is it gives us this new power over time and space. So 200 years ago, if you wanted to have a real-time interaction or conversation with somebody, the two of you had to be in the same place at the same time. Uh, but today, uh, using cell phones, we can talk to people anywhere in the world, even if they're far away. We can also record things and play them back. For example, you can listen to uh, Louis Armstrong performing music now, even though Louis Armstrong isn't alive anymore. Um, so, you know, this, this live interaction is one thing that's also very compelling. So the, we take this for granted. We can't even imagine what it would be like not to have our cell phones or telephones at all. So. As wonderful as multimedia is, um, it's important to remember that we don't just live in a sound of uh, we don't just live in a world of sounds and moving images. The world that we live in is this physical 3D world with real physical objects. So, the goal of our project is to give is to have the same type of control that we have now, where we can render arbitrary sounds and arbitrary moving images. Uh, we want to have that over physical objects. So we want to be able to create physical, real physical objects that are under complete software control. So they can turn into any shape, they can move, they can look like anything, and so on. So I'm going to tell you more about that uh, in, in this talk. And one of the reasons why I think that this is exciting is that it's going to enable some very interesting new applications. And it will create new opportunities for changing the way that we interact with computation and make it much more natural, I think. So if we, think, if we sort of dive down and think about what's at the heart of audio and video, why, what, what is the technology behind this and what makes it work, <clears throat> at the heart of it, we found a way to take <clears throat> some physical phenomena, for example, sound waves or photons, and we have a way to capture this. For example, for audio, you can use a, a microphone, like the one I'm talking into now. And you can turn that into uh, either a signal or a digital file to represent the sound. And then you can use something else. And for audio, it's a speaker to reproduce that sound. Now, the sound that you've reproduced, you haven't uh, transported the original sound waves. These are different sound waves. Um, they sound enough like the original sound that, as humans, we can recognize them and understand that we hear somebody talking or we hear music or whatever. <clears throat> and for video, of course, we use cameras and displays to do the same kind of thing. So the idea for what we want to do now is capture and reproduce moving physical objects. And we call that Pario. So we've got audio and video today and this new thing we're calling Pario. So 
the idea is how do, how do we capture it? Well, people have already been doing this for um, animated movies, for example. So actors uh, will move around and they'll do motion capture and not only record what the actor looked like, but they also record their geometry. They know exactly where they are, where their arms are, and everything. And you could reconstruct a 3D model of, of the person. Now, often today, they have to wear special tags on a special suit to do this accurately, and we'd like to do it without that. But, but there's already um, a path for, for doing the, the 3D capture of something. The more interesting part that we're focusing on is how do, you, how do you do the rendering part? How do you generate this physical moving object? And that's, that's what I'll be telling you about. So before I get into that, the last point I wanted to make here is that at each time that uh, one of these new multimedia types has been created, it's, it's created entire industries, you know, cell phones, television, you know, movies, all those types of things. So the hope is that if we have this other kind of uh, multimedia type, media type rather, um, I think a lot of other exciting things will result from this. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little more about that too. So ah, let me back up for a second. So the picture here, the idea is, imagine that this is a medical student and they're trying to learn how to examine an infant. So how could they do this? Well, if we used audio, you could hear a recording of an infant crying or not cooperating. And that would be maybe not very useful because that doesn't it's not really anything like really examining an infant. You could watch a movie of an infant wiggling around and see doctors examining an infant. Uh, but what if you really wanted to really train a doctor to do this hands-on? Well, you could give them a baby doll, uh, but that won't really move or anything like a real infant. Uh, you could use a live infant, but there's probably human subjects uh, issues with that. So another possibility would be to have a, a real actual physical model of an infant that moves and wiggles and cries and doesn't cooperate. Um, and then the doctor could be, you know, working with that. So that's one way you might use this. Okay, so if you zoomed in on this, this little computer-generated infant, what you might see, um, so how are we going to make this material that can form into any object and move and look like anything? There are probably a number of different ways to do it. And in this project, we're looking at one particular way, which is to have a, large, a very, very large number of very, very small robots um, that are, it might look something like this. So we have little spherical-ish shaped robots. And each one of them, uh, you can think of this as being a physical equivalent of a voxel. So it's a 3D thing. It occupies a point in space, and it can light up with a particular color. Um, and it includes a lot of the things that you would think of as being in a normal computer. So it has a processor, memory, networking, and so on. Um, the thing that's really different about it compared to a normal uh, computer is that it has a way to uh, move. So each of these little robots, they can somehow uh, attract to each other, they can bind uh, to each other, and they can also move around each other. So you might, they might move using something like, say, magnetics or electrostatic forces, and that's what's going to bind them together or cause them to roll around. And that's how they will form a shape and move from one shape to another shape. And also, uh, we want them to be able to take on the appearance of, of anything, so they also have some way of projecting video. And that could happen in different ways. OK, so when, when, uh, when, other, when video displays were invented, we didn't start off with high HD TVs. We started off with something that was fairly low resolution, and over time, the resolution has improved. And the same thing is going to happen here. So you can imagine if your goal is to reproduce a skeleton, in the near term, uh, it's going to be a low fidelity reproduction. But as the technology improves, it'll, the fidelity will get better and better. But our, we got excited about this. We decided we were, we're going to go ahead and start working on this, even though we can only build low fidelity um, things today because we see a path for creating these high fidelity things in the future. Okay, so then this picture is showing, okay, so we started working on this and one, we wanted to start really building the hardware. And one thing that we decided to do to make life a little bit easier for us is rather than going ahead and building a 3D sphere, uh, we started working in two dimensions. So what we're trying to do is build something like a little hockey puck, where if you look down on it, these things would have some ability to roll around each other and form 
you know, a projection of this shape. So <clears throat> this is just showing how the hardware has evolved over time. And I've got uh, two of these guys right here. I'll turn one over. So those are just one of the generations of technology here. And um, these things have different. Oh, OK. So over on the white thing, if you can zoom in on the white piece of paper, there's uh, some of the hardware here. Great. So it's basically what you're seeing. So I brought some of it here. You can come up and look at this if you like. OK. So if we go back to the PowerPoint output now. OK. So if you look at this, this actually is a cylinder with various rings in it for um, controlling the magnets. In these cases, in this case, what we have are um, an array of magnets around the outside of this thing. So the way that they roll, roll around each other is that we control the magnets, the electromagnets, independently. And we can make them attract or repel each other. And that's how they move. <clears throat> so I actually have a movie here, which for some reason doesn't project very well in PowerPoint. So I'm going to jump out of PowerPoint for a second. I'm going to attempt to do that. Oops. All right. There we go. OK. Hopefully this will. OK, so this was a, an exciting moment for us because this was the first time that one of our prototypes actually did anything. So it was, uh, these are two of these little robots. They're sitting on top of a, a, a surface that has strips of metal, which are alternately power and ground. And it's using its feet to get power out of that. And they're uh, just talking to each other and, and rolling around. So that's a little, that's like the first baby step toward making this, this thing work. OK, so OK. And then this is, the, this is a later version of this, where we actually have three of them working now. And one of them is handing off one to the other. So this is, you're looking down on robots that look like, like this. So in this prototype, we're using magnets at this scale. So these things, you can see how big across they are. They're about an inch and a half in diameter right now. Um, the idea is that we want these to be about a millimeter across. And as they scale down, we won't be using magnets anymore, we think. We think it's too difficult to make good small magnets. Instead, we'll probably be using electrostatic uh, forces. And I'll talk more about that later in the talk. <clears throat> but functionally, this has, other than the video display and other than the fact that it works just in 2D and not 3D, a lot of the computational parts that we need are already in this prototype here. OK, so the interesting thing is going, looking forward from this, this video I just showed you, uh, we want to make much smaller versions of this, and we want to make many, many more of them. So one of the design principles that we've adopted is um, we don't actually care that individual uh, robots, that they're very useful on their own. Uh, they're only, they only need to work in a group. So for example, we, we can make the individuals as simple as they, as, they, uh, as they can be as long as the group works. So for example, if you just set one of these on the desk, it would have no way of powering itself or moving. It would just sit there quietly, and it would do nothing. They can only move uh, by attracting and repelling each other. And they only get energy by passing energy around through each other from some other energy source. So. Um, <clears throat> There's this thing we call the ensemble principle, which we're basically saying only the, the collection has to work. The individuals don't really need to function uh, independently. And also, for the sake of mass producing these things, one of our other goals was to build these with no moving mechanical parts. So the motion occurs through electrical force, through magnetic or electrostatic forces, but there are no little mechanical arms or things that are moving around. And we, we're doing that because our intuition is that this will be good when we want to build millimeter scale versions of these things. Question? This question may be way too early in the talk. Oh. Uh, this is awesome. Um, do the, does that first baby step have any sort of sensing? That was sort of the one of the motivating things you had. <clears throat> if I push on those, can they tell they've moved? Um, no, not that, that prototype doesn't yet. But that's definitely something we, we want to put into it. Yeah, I'll talk more about that. So interacting with, we really want these things to be able to sense human interaction. So that's, that's really important. We think that's very 
straightforward to do. We just didn't put that into this prototype. Okay, so finally, another thing is, um, you know, our prototypes don't have a video display, but the idea is we also want this thing to be able to somehow project video. Now, one really low-tech way to do that would be to externally project video onto it like a little screen. It'd be more, it'd be preferable if they could project the video out themselves. If the units are fairly large, then they might look like little screens with multiple pixels on them, but when they get to be <clears throat> small enough, each one will just be like an individual pixel on a screen, and it only needs to sh light up in one uh, particular color at a time. Okay, so a way to think of this conceptually is what we're trying to build is we call this, this technology uh, claytronics um, because it was inspired by claymation. If you see a claymation animated movie, um, you know, they do it frame at a time, and somebody comes in and pushes something and moves it a little bit. So Wallace and Gromit is one example of this kind of movie. So if you saw this thing moving around, it would look like claymation that was moving itself uh, because it's, it's actually a lot of computers. Okay, so that's the concept. So what I'm going to talk about next is I'm going to first discuss, uh, before I get into the technology for making this work some more, I'm going to first discuss some applications of, of this. Then I'll tell you more about what we've been doing at uh, Carnegie Mellon and Intel to try to make this happen. And then I will uh, go back and talk about even further out applications. I found that it's good to push out the further apl out applications until the end of the talk so that you don't just uh, laugh and walk out of the room. <clears throat> okay, so I'll start with these uh, nearer term but still fantastical seeming applications. <clears throat> Actually, the first one is fairly straightforward. So one thing we could do if we had this hardware is something we call a 3D fax machine. And this is very simple because we don't even need um, the things to move around. So imagine that you're um, <clears throat> out looking for dinosaur bones somewhere, and you don't want to haul a 3D printer or scanner with you. All that you have is a collection of this claytronics material. So you find an interesting dinosaur bone. And you want to send this, a copy of it immediately back to the museum so that they can look at it. So what you could do is um, you could take, now these are just marbles, but imagine that these are these little robots. We would just pour them or mold them around the object that we care about. And then what they would do is they would talk to each other and figure out um, where they weren't. They, they would figure out where the void is. So it's like casting, it's like sand casting is what we're doing. And now we'd have a CAD model of the object, and then we could just send that electronically through the internet somewhere else. And then on the other side, you just have a lump of this material, and you broadcast that into it, and the parts that are supposed to be part of the object all bind together. Everything else just relaxes and falls away. And then you would unwrap it and you would have the object. So the nice thing is compared to, say, 3D printing, you don't need a big bulky 3D printer and a scanner. You can just use this material. So that's a very simple thing that you might be able to do with this. So something that I find much more exciting, and this is probably the part that's most relevant to uh, an HCI type of audience, is I think this is, would, would allow us to have a much more natural way of designing and interacting with 3D objects. So many people, um, what they do for a living is they're working in, with a 3D object in some form. So for example, if you're an architect or an engineer or a doctor, you're spending all of your time thinking about these uh, things like houses or molecules or whatever. And the way we do that today is inside the computer, we have this mathematical model of the 3D structure of the thing that we're working with. But in order to interact with it, what we do is we look at a picture of it on our screen. And it's difficult to think of that in 3D, so maybe we spin it around so we can imagine it in three dimensions. And maybe you send it off to a 3D printer if you want to hold one of these things in your hand. But um, what I would really prefer to have is just a physical model. So this is the reason why architects actually build models of houses, because it's easier to think about them if you can walk around and touch them and, and so on. So what you would do is you would render this physically. You'd have this object, and you could hold it in your hands. And the reason why I think it's particularly exciting is it's not just an output technology. It can also be used as an input technology. So if I press on this, it can sense that, I'm, that something is pressing it other than itself and interpret that as, oh, somebody's pushing on here or clicking. 
You can think of this as being a touch screen, but you know, the next step beyond a flat touch screen. This is like a 3D touch screen that can feel you, sense that you're manipulating it. So then, for example, if I had a house, let's say it's an architect and they're showing you a model of a house, if you don't like something about the design, you could just grab something and move it around. Um, now, compared with normal, just say, modeling clay, if I grab regular modeling clay or cardboard and move it, um, it's not necessarily going to do the right thing. But in this case, it has a model of what a proper house is like. So if I move a door, it realizes it still needs to be connected to the ground, and it has to have certain properties for fire code, and so on. Or if I'm trying to do protein folding, <clears throat> The object that I'm, the molecule or protein that I'm holding can understand that if I bend it this way, there'll be a lot of force opposing that, or if I bend it this other way, there'll be a lot of uh, attractive forces, and so on. <clears throat> so another thing that I think that's interesting about this is if we think about how we do 2D drawing and how we create 2D objects today, we don't do them freehand typically. Usually we have these toolbars that understand how to do things like build, draw lines or you know, circles or squares and we can stretch them and color them and everything. So imagine all of that now <clears throat> in physical 3D. So I can say, okay, I want to start with a cube and now I'm going to pull it apart and I'm going to do this and this. And it's not just oozing around my fingers, it's actually maintaining the structure that I want it to have. <clears throat> so, so sometimes I would start telling people about this technology that I found very exciting. And maybe about this point in the discussion, they'd say, OK, so it's a hologram? And I'd say, no, 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 no. So to try to make it a little more clear what we're talking about, we uh, sponsored a team at the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon. So a group of five graduate students, we asked them to put together a concept video to show you what this might look like. Now, these are mostly artistic type students coming up with their own idea of what this looks like, so it's not completely scientifically correct, but I wanted to show you this video, which is illustrating how it might be used in physical Imagine design. Imagine a technology that lets you create objects on the fly. Powerful new medium formed by billions so of microscopic robots. As they adjust the Each headlight, it's still a proper headlight. It didn't just that squish or interact. Bring your ideas to the table and let it take shape, form, and color. Rendered dynamically out of captured 3D data, you can now touch it, feel it, mold it in your hands. A programmable matter that transforms your imagination into reality. Playtronics, make it happen. <clears throat> has fairly cheesy music too. I like, we like the music. One of the students wrote the music too. And they filmed all this in one day and then they spent a couple of months doing the graphics for it. <clears throat> okay, so that's one thing you might do is you're a car designer or an architect, but I think another area where this interactive 3D modeling might be especially interesting is in medicine. If you go to the, a hospital or see a doctor, <clears throat> there are a lot of interesting technologies now for capturing images of, of what your body's doing, things like MRI, ultrasound, and so on. But when the doctor gets this information, they usually get it <clears throat> as these 2D slices, so they can look at a slice of your body. Uh, but what they probably prefer to have is just a physical model again. So imagine you know, you're sitting there, you're being scanned, and then there's an actual model of you. Another thing that they could do is zoom in on it. So <clears throat> you can imagine taking something very tiny, like a tiny blood vessel, and blowing it up, just like a microscope takes a tiny image and makes it into a large image. I could take <clears throat> a small physical structure and turn it into a large um, <clears throat> physical structure. And then you could imagine that the surgeons could even uh, practice the surgery, or maybe even one day perform the surgery by interacting with this model. So you could say, OK, we're going to do heart surgery by walking into this room that has the beating chamber of the heart, and we're going to bring our big tools, and we're going to you know, clear out the clogged arteries and so on. And when we're doing this, it's just sensing what we're doing and having a little robot do the same thing inside your body. <clears throat> OK, so, so that's one way that this might be useful is for, say, interactive 3D design and modeling. Another reason why I think that this uh, technology would be exciting is simply from the fact that it can change uh, form. 
So one reason why, uh, so one thing that motivates this for me is I don't really want to carry around anything much larger than my phone. You know, a phone fits in my pocket and that's convenient. But if I want to do real work, a phone is not convenient. I can't really, it's got a little screen, has a little keyboard. So if I was going to do real work, it'd be nice if it could turn itself into a laptop. So, okay, so to make that a little more concrete, so this is um, <clears throat> a million, this, this is actually just a piece of plastic, <clears throat> but this would be the size of <clears throat> a million millimeter scale catoms uh, densely packed into a little thing. And this is actually smaller than my cell phone, so I could put this in my pocket or my iPhone or whatever. So I'd be happy carrying this around. <clears throat> And then this is the same number of, of these things. It's just stretched out into you know, something that's uh, a large screen. So this is like a very large iPod or iPhone. So <clears throat> you could have something like this. Now it has a nice display. Maybe I can type on it or whatever. And when I'm finished, it can shrink back down into something this size, and I could carry it around again. In fact, it could even turn into a piece of jewelry if I preferred that. So. That's one possibility. Um, you know, another application that we noticed that we thought of where shape is important is for antennas. So the properties of antennas are dictated entirely by their shape. So we're, we've been exploring the idea of using this material to form antennas where you can arbitrarily control their uh, transmission and reception properties. OK. So those are some of the things you could do with this. And now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the research we've been doing into, into how to build actual software and hardware to make this really work. Um, so the first thing that we did is there are a set of basic things that this system would have to do in order for it to work at all. So it has to have energy, it has to have communication, and, and the individual units need to know where they are. So. There's a lot more detail I could dive into here. I'm, I'm going to skip over the, the detail a little bit. If you're interested, I can tell you more about this. But a thing that makes this very interesting and challenging is scale. So there are people who have been working on how to build distributed systems or even just sets of distributed robotic systems uh, that have to work together or something. But we, we are trying to build uh, algorithms that will work at the scale of millions to billions of nodes. So if I have a, a millimeter-sized uh, robot, and at one cubic meter of them would be a billion of those things. So I would like, if I'm going to build human-scale objects um, using these, then I have to think about very, very large numbers of them. Now, the object that I render won't necessarily be completely dense. It may be mostly hollow, but it's still probably on the order of millions of things. And it's not only that there are a lot of them. To make life even more interesting and challenging, they're moving around. And it's likely that, some of the, that they'll break non-trivially often. So we need really robust algorithms. We don't want to simply take um, existing algorithms and tweak them a little bit and think that this will work. We've been trying to sort of start over and think of really robust and scalable algorithms for making everything work. So um, some of the things we, the first thing that we started with was uh, power. So how will we power up these things? If we can't solve that problem, uh, forget it, this will never work. And it's not likely that you can put a battery in this that will last for an interesting amount of time. So when people talk about uh, sensor networks, you can imagine attaching a battery to a little sensor and putting it somewhere, and maybe that would last for uh, weeks or months. But, but those sensors aren't doing very much. They don't require that much energy. In this case, moving a robot around consumes energy fairly quickly. So we can't simply ha put in batteries and be changing them. We don't have enough grad students to do that. OK, I'm just kidding. So uh, instead, uh, they do have a capacitor. They have some limited ability to hold energy for some period of time. But what we have to do is build a power grid. And the idea is that they're either sitting on a powered surface, and they can get energy that way, or they possibly are carrying you know, a battery or something along with them. But what they do is they form uh, graphs so there's a, a, connect, a graph that connects you to power, a graph that connects you to ground. And they have to dynamically update these graphs as, as they're moving around. And so we have algorithms to make that work. And it, it turns out that that's surprisingly, surprisingly robust. So we, we're, we're not worried about that. 
we also have to have a way of doing networking. So most of the communication occurs just through nearest neighbor communication. And there are some interesting details about how we do that. The routing is geographically based rather than sort of IP based and so on. But um, I won't go into much detail about that. And finally, um, they need to figure out where they are. So it would be wonderful if something like GPS worked at this physical scale, but we don't think it does. So instead, they mostly figure out where they are by talking to their neighbors. So you know who you're connected to because you can send messages back and forth to them, but you don't know ex the exact angle at which you're connected because there's some amount of error, you know, you're connected plus or minus, minus some number of degrees. And that error can really add up quickly when you start putting such large numbers of things together. So we've looked at uh, machine learning algorithms for trying to accurately piece all this information together, and that's been, we've gotten some nice results there. Okay, so I just glossed over a lot of stuff that I'll come back and get to later if you're interested, uh, or you can come up and talk to me about it. So the basic things work. The basic plumbing and infrastructure works, we think. So, so we can power these things up and they can do something. So another thing that we spent a while thinking about is how do we get them to move around? So we have to get them to form into shapes and they need to render moving things. So we've come up with a, a few ideas here. Um, so I want to start by saying our assumption was that traditional planning algorithms for robotics probably wouldn't work here because they're typically designed to scale to maybe tens of robots, not millions or billions of robots. So uh, we're trying to think uh, from a clean slate here. So the first idea that we came up with was actually uh, the student said he was inspired by semiconductor physics where in semiconductors, you think not only about electrons, but also about holes, you know, places where electrons aren't. So the idea was, rather than thinking of this as a solid, densely packed chunk of material, what if we intentionally put holes into the structure? And then we could have the holes move around. So to move a hole, what really happens is you're moving some robots out of the way. So that, but the net effect is, as the robots move one way, the hole moves the other way. So now if you could inject these holes, the idea is you'd have these holes bouncing around somewhat like uh, gas particles inside a balloon. And they bounce off of each other and they bounce off the surface. And the reason why that's interesting is if I want to grow a surface, if I want to make something larger, I can just tell the surface to start creating new holes and injecting them into the material. And if I want to shrink a surface, I can tell it to start uh, capturing holes and not letting them bounce. So this way I can make uh, surfaces either grow or uh, contract. So a reason why, um, so some things that we like about this are um, that this is, seems to be a very scalable way to do shape control because um, we can imagine having any number of holes um, at a local level, at a hole level, um, there's a deterministic control over what's happening because you're moving the hole uh, around. Um, you also have to control the surface and tell the surface you should either shrink or grow, but otherwise everything else is stochastic. We're just relying on holes bouncing around and so on. So that, makes, that creates some challenges, but it also makes this uh, a very scalable way to do things. And then here's an example of uh, us creating a shape where we're both uh, growing a uh, surface in green and shrinking the surface in blue, and we're building something like an upside down letter V. So that was one of our ideas. And so at a, at a macro scale, you think of these holes bouncing around. At a, at a smaller scale, if you zoom in, the individual robots are talking to each other and building up little subgraphs and deciding how they're going to move around. Okay. So that was our one idea, is whole motion. Um, but then the next step beyond that was we were thinking, well, there's some nice things about whole motion, but there are also some things that are a little awkward. So if we think about sculptors and how they build things, they don't think about little holes bouncing around. The way they typically think is, well, we want to add something here or delete something here. So <clears throat> maybe it would be nice if, that was, if those were our primitives. So if I'm starting off with this orange block of material, maybe I want to you know, make something grow here, make something shrink here, if I want to go from one shape to another shape. OK, so, so what we like to do, oh, actually, I'll back up for a second. We'd like to have these 
this somewhat magical property, seeming property, where I can arbitrarily add something and delete something as long as I'm doing it along a surface. So to do this, the idea was we're going to pop up a, a, a little bit. Rather than thinking of individual robots, we're going to think of these units that are actually collections of robots. But that's the, the scale at which we'll do planning. And we call that collection a particular meta module. Now, one of these units, let's say it's a, a cube of a certain size, it could either be mostly full, completely packed, or it could be almost entirely empty. So if it's almost completely full, then what you could do is have one of these uh, spit out another one. If it has enough material in it, it could pop one out along the surface, and you could create another one of these meta modules. If you have two next to each other that are mostly empty, then one of them could pull the other one inside of itself. So you can imagine at this meta module scale, if we put the right things in the right place, they might be able to shrink and grow along their surface. So that was uh, another idea that we had. And we built a planning, motion planning algorithm based on that idea. And this approach has some a really nice property, which is uh, fairly simple heuristics tend to work well. They don't get stuck. One problem with robotic motion planning sometimes is you can get into a state where something looks like it's going to be an easy transformation, but in fact there's something that's really blocking it, like a gridlock that doesn't let you move forward. But we, we don't have that problem in this case. So here's just an animation of us using the meta module planning algorithm to turn a, a cube into a trumpet shape. Okay. So what we've really done is we split the problem into two different layers. There's this higher level abstraction where you're thinking about just putting craters and destroyers in the right place. But at a lower level, you really do have to manage the amount of material that you have. And you can't do this arbitrarily. I can't just grow and grow and grow. At some point, I run out of robots. And I also can't shrink arbitrarily because at some point, everything becomes completely full. But that's almost more like an operating system type resource management problem at the, at the lower level. Yep. Those sort of physics into your simulations? Um, <clears throat> actually, our, simula yeah, our simulators do have gravity in them. But um, so for the magnetic things we've been doing so far, we've been worried, worried about that. So these, these things are not um, strong enough to lift themselves against gravity. If I turned it this way, they're not, the magnets aren't strong enough for them to, to go up. But um, at the, at the <clears throat> millimeter scale where we're dealing with electrostatics, um, they are strong enough to do that. In fact, a nice thing is that um, as we make these things smaller, uh, the bad news is that the ability to exert force on each other goes down. But the good news is that their weight, their mass, also goes down. And it turns out that it goes down faster uh, than, the f than the forces go down. So it actually bec the problem becomes easier and easier, in a sense, as they get smaller and smaller. It's one of these nice things where scaling down actually makes it more favorable rather than more difficult. So at the smaller scale, they have no trouble holding themselves up against gravity for the most part. OK, so we just talked about whole motion and, and meta modules. Um, but those are good ways to think about moving things around within a lattice structure. So we could have this you know, uh, you know, hex-packed lattice structure, and you could say, you should pull yourself out of that position in the lattice and insert yourself in this other position in the lattice. But sometimes we, th we think we, we want to have interesting motions that aren't based on lattices. So if, for example, if I think about you know, creating something like a human object, and when we move our arms, we don't really have a lattice motion as we're bending at a joint. We have a different kind of motion. So we were thinking about how we build something like a muscle. We want something that can shrink or bend or twist. So the idea we had was um, we're going to build units out of, again, collections of robots. But this, and this, this is a 2D version of it. If I had eight robots like this, they could form together into something that was either very tall and skinny or something that was very you know, flat and wide. And they could imagine being in any continuous point in between. Now, if I took collections of these, imagine these are like cells in a muscle, and I pack them together, then I could have this overall structure that could move from something that looks like this to something that looks like that. And now what you can do is create these kinds of motions here, where I can have something that can stretch out and bend based on changing the different relative angles within all these different units. 
Okay, and we also extended that into three dimensions. And it looks like there are even aspects of this that might be good in terms of uh, forces and, uh, you know, and creating strong muscles. Okay, so those are the, some of the things that we've been doing to try to uh, move these things around in interesting ways. Another thing that we've been doing is looking at uh, programming languages to support this. Um, so uh, there's probably more detail on the slides than I want to dive into, but the basic problem here is programming uh, any kind of distributed system is challenging. Um, and these systems are doing a lot of different, fairly complicated things. They're communicating with each other, they're creating these power grids, they're doing motion planning, and our concern is that the programming problem will become overwhelming. You know, you'll try to change something and suddenly everything will fall apart and nothing's going to work anymore. So <clears throat> what we've been doing is uh, looking at uh, declarative programming approaches uh, to programming these things. So one anal rough analogy is if you think about databases, you know, people write SQL queries in this sort of short, concise, declarative language, and that turns into a huge amount of work under the covers inside the database management system to make that really happen. And it would be nice if we could do that type of thing here. If we could program the robots saying fairly simple things and this somehow gets synthesized into a whole lot of uh, detail to make that work. And we've looked at two different, we've been built, come up with two different languages so far. Um, the first one is based on distributed pattern matching. And we originally developed that just to do debugging because that was hard. And then the other one is a, a pr language we call MELD, which is more like a prologue type of language based on uh, logic. <clears throat> okay, so the LDP, um, the first one, I'll just skip ahead here a little bit. But the idea is that you want to, we originally developed this for debugging because sometimes when things go wrong with these robots, um, it's usually because a collection of things got in a bad uh, overall state. It isn't that you could look at one specific one and find that something interesting had broken. So you'd like to set a watch point and say, well, if I ever get into this state across three neighbors, then that's bad and I want to know about that. So the idea is we you have a way of specifying that you know, for two neighbors, A and B, this is just a really simple contrived example, if it turned out to be bad that A had a value 1 and B had a value 3, I would want to know about that. So for example, so here are our parameters and our conditions, and we have some state variables. So we could imagine you just specify this query, it would somehow run on the system, and it could identify these cases where the bad condition had occurred. And what really happens is we have to do pattern matching across a set of different robots, and we want to do that efficiently. The brute force way to do it would be to exchange information all the time, and that would be very inefficient. So we have some cleverness for coming up with these efficient ways to do the pattern matching. And what I'm showing you now is on the right, unfortunately, because of the screen resolution, you can't really read it very well, but that's the entire source code here to do um, a tree-like aggregation over all these robots. So the first thing that it's doing is um, building a spanning tree, and then it's collecting information and aggregating it. So it's a fairly small amount of code, and it's doing something somewhat interesting. And this next example is our uh, meta-module planner. Again, yeah, unfortunately, you can't read the individual things. You can read them on this screen if you want to come down and see later. Um, so that's doing the meta-module planning. And the reason why we care about code size is we're really concerned about, uh, m we want it to be easy to modify the code, and we don't want to, you know, we want to avoid bugs, basically. That's the thing that we're worried about. And we also want to be able to prove things about the properties of the, of the code, and we've been able to do that successfully. Okay, so then MELD is another language based on something more like Prolog, where you can write these rules, and based on simple sets of rules, you can get things to move around. So this isn't an entirely new idea. People have been using this to program, this type of style for programming robots for a while. So you can end up with much less code than if you wrote this in, say, something like C++. Um, so, you know, C++ lines of code in orange, meld expressions in blue and purple. So it's less code, and it's just about as efficient. So that's, that's one approach that we've been looking at. And then this is a very simple example where we just want to have a set of robots uh, move towards some light source. 
So it's not a, a super robust program because some of them are getting left behind. But again, it's a very small amount of code to wrap your head around. So a reason why we like having these rules is that the, the system actually has to do many different things. It has to route power, move, maintain structural integrity. And what we want to do is just add more and more rules into the system and have it continue to build something that obeys all of them. So if you did it you know, the traditional uh, way where you focus on individual robots, as you add new tasks, it gets more and more painful to think about all the different interactions between them. And in this case, all the pain is taken care of us, hopefully, by the languages uh, compiler and runtime system. OK, so I've talked about, yep? Um, it, it seems like you have good efficiencies sending a program out to the nodes where they would just sort of broadcast out. But what about getting data back? Do you have bottlenecking problems? <clears throat> yeah, in fact, the stuff we've done on networking has been focusing on that. So how do we efficiently aggregate information back in from all the nodes? And um, so we've looked at ways to build, you know, basically tree-like structures to locally aggregate things and then aggregate them uh, to the, their parents and so on. So it's a little different from what people have done in sensor networks, but it's a similar type of thing, I guess. It's different partly because uh, things are densely packed and there's a larger number of them, but otherwise it's the same basic idea of use a tree structure to combine things in parallel. So. Okay, so I've talked a, a bit about uh, the software and now I'll tell you more about the hardware and, and how we see this, uh, how we see building these things. <clears throat> okay, so as I said before, we want these things to move without having any moving mechanical parts. So we want to use electromagnetics to make them move. So we can either use uh, magnets, which is what we do in this, and these are existing prototypes. But um, at a small scale, as I said before, we want to use electric fields. So this is essentially, the idea is you basically are going to build a capacitor across two neighboring robots, where you've got one plate on one side and one on the other side. And this capacitor can, you know, will, will cause them to attract to each other. So we wanted to start, what we believe is that there's not a smooth uh, continuum of designs between this larger scale and the millimeter scale. We think that the way it'll progress is we, we imagine actually just jumping directly to the millimeter scale rather than building things progressively smaller and smaller. Because um, we, know we, want, we think we want to do electrostatics and we want them to weigh very little, so we really do want to jump to a small size. Um, and the first thing we wanted to do was to build good um, electrostatic plates, that we, these electrodes that we could use to create, create these capacitors. And one possibility would be to use rigid plates, so these are rigid structures, or you could use flexible things like aluminum foil. Um, you know, both have their advantages and disadvantages, but um, the, we, we think that the flexible uh, plates were much more attractive because they can create, in theory, much larger forces because it's hard to avoid having gaps between these rigid plates. Even if they seem like they're very flat, they're not close enough to get the higher forces we can get with the flexible plates. So to start experimenting with this, we uh, did uh, scaling in a, in a surprising direction. We built catoms, we built our robots uh, that were two meters across. So these are people standing down here at the bottom. The reason we did this is we, to simulate something like having the, uh, the mass, the weight, and uh, force that we expect to see at a millimeter scale, it was easier to work with helium-filled balloons. We thought we can use the helium to make them weigh less uh, given their surface area. So the idea was to build these electrostatic latches and have very large things moving around. Um, and we did that and it didn't work. This was, it did not work. This is one of these failed experiments where we thought we learned something interesting. And the reason it didn't work is the same reason why you can peel scotch tape off of a tape dispenser. So the problem is, although in theory we had high forces here, the, at the edge it would peel away. So it's very easy to get these things to start to peel, and once they peeled, it didn't work anymore. So, um, so we've come up, the basic, okay, no, sorry, I know this is an HCI seminar, so I'm getting into a lot of double E stuff here, but, um, but the, the upshot is we found a much better way to design these electrodes where we have the plates sort of move in like this rather than, uh, so that they can't uh, peel away from each other as easily, and we get really strong forces this way. So we can build 
Uh, we've got prototypes of these things where we can charge it up with a battery, take the battery away, and we have such strong force that you can't pull it apart with your arms. Um, it's, it's really strong. So we think that this, we think we see a way to make these electrodes. Okay, but that's at a larger scale. We really want to start working at a millimeter scale. So what you're seeing in this movie is again, we're trying to start easy and work in two dimensions rather than three dimensions. So what we have here is a tube um, that we're electrostatically controlling. We're moving it across these different wires here. So the tubes are very small. I have some here. They're uh, like a, just a couple millimeters across. And what's going on here is it's just a, a passive tube. It's just a piece of metal. But we're uh, intelligently controlling the charge across these different wires, and that's the thing that causes it to want to move around. So we can move it back and forth this way. So what you're seeing here in this movie was a, a passive tube on an active substrate. What we really want to do, though, is everything intelligent has to go into the robot, not outside of the robot. So the next step is to create these equivalent of these separate wires on the surface of the tube, and we've done that. In fact, I've got some of those tubes with me. Um, and then we'll have the control inside of it, and then that can move itself across some other surface. And uh, we've done uh, all of our simulations and everything for this. So we, uh, we fabricated these, and we're on about to start testing those out also. OK, so actually, I'll skip over that part. OK, so then another thing, uh, all right. So we, we can imagine using electrostatics to move these things around. Uh, but another challenge is how will we mass produce these things? So we want to be creating 3D objects in a very cheap way. We'd like to use, uh, to the extent that we can, just conventional photolithography and MEMS techniques. But the problem is that those are designed to build 2D structures, uh, you know, flat structures, and we want spheres. So one idea uh, that we, uh, one of our collaborators had, Rob Reed, is when, when silicon gets thin enough, it actually is fairly flexible. And in fact, a problem that uh, MEMS people have is avoiding having a structure warp. Uh, if, unless you get the doping just right, when something is released, it'll tend to want to curve up or curve down. It turns out that it's easy to manipulate something to intentionally warp it. So the idea is, imagine if you think about a globe, when you buy a globe, there's paper on the surface of the globe. That paper was actually printed uh, uh, flat in such a way that it can fold up into a sphere. So it's basically that same idea. We're going to print out something on, on the surface. In this case, it looks like a flower petal, where when we release it, it'll spring up and, and fold into a sphere. That's the idea. And then hopefully, we could fabricate the, the logic and circuitry that we need on the surface of it, and that'll just get folded inside. So this was Rob's first experiment where he was doing this. So he released these different arms, and they warped up into something that looks a little bit like a sphere. And this is sort of a slightly improved design, where now it looks more of a slightly, like a slightly dense sphere, and we'd put a capacitor into it before we roll it up. And then this is one of his more recent uh, pictures. So this is on a, a electro, uh, on a microscope here. You can see him changing the focal depth here to see this 3D structure. And then finally, this is one of these spheres, which is about half a millimeter in diameter, being uh, moved around. It's the same experiment that you saw before with a tube, but now it's in 3D. So it's just a metal sphere, but we're alternating the charge on these w wires here to make it roll around and move. So that's, that's one way that we can imagine mass producing these 3D objects, is to have them fold up like the paper on the surface of a globe. Another idea that, that uh, our, one of our collaborators came up with at Intel was to actually create hemispherical molds um, by just etching them out. Um, then you could imagine filling that hemispheric mold with um, the electrodes, the metal that you need. Then you could uh, fill that with something else and then have the, power, the circuitry and power chips just as normal uh, circles here, and then you would release two of these things and bond them together and get uh, spheres that way. So there's a lot of detail I'm intentionally not going into here. But you could imagine in, in, in a wafer, if we build 600, you know, 0.6 millimeter uh, diameter uh, 
robots, then we'd have 226,000 of them on a wafer. Or if we build smaller ones, 0.2 millimeter ones, we'd have 2 million uh, per wafer. Uh, and he actually did this. Um, he didn't build complete working ones, but he built molds and he built um, the glass uh, hemispheres. And in fact, I have some of those here if you want to see some of them. Okay, so we see a path to making the hardware and the software work. And I've talked a little bit about what you could do with this. Now the next step is I'm going to go back and tell you about some, some other ideas I have for how we might use this. <clears throat> and in fact, this is the original motivating application that I had that led me to work on this. And that is remote interaction. So I said before, it's great that we can call people on our phones anywhere in the world. Um, but the fact is that we still travel a lot. Uh, we go on business trips. You know, why are the freeways all clogged? Because people are going to work. Well, why are they going to work? Why aren't they just telecommuting? So uh, these people look like happy telecommuters. Why don't we all just telecommute all the time? And the answer is, I think, because there's real value in face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and there are people who can't do, there also are people who can't do their jobs just over the phone. So if you're a, a paramedic, you can't just always, you know, talk to people and, and solve the problems. So what this suggests to me is that there's a, a room for improvement. We could build technology that would make remote interaction better because there's clearly still a gap between <coughs> voice uh, conversation and actually being there in person. <coughs> so what we want to do is create something that could pass a new kind of Turing test for remote interaction. We want to make remote interaction so good that you really can't tell the difference between whether it's remote or whether you're really there. Um, you know, it wouldn't literally be true. You could still figure out that these rendered things weren't real people. If you touched them, they wouldn't feel like people. Um, but, and for practical purposes, there wouldn't be any reason to, for business travel anymore unless you wanted to go see the beach or the mountains or something like that. <clears throat> and the important thing here is it's not just about the people. Um, in fact, really, um, when you interact with somebody, um, you maybe you shake hands or something, but there isn't typically a whole lot of physical interaction with people. There's a lot of physical interaction with your environment. So the desks and the whiteboards and chairs and everything, all of that needs to be the same, and that's, that's important. So, so, um, so you might say, well, okay, this is one way to do it, but we've got other technologies for remote interaction. What about video conferencing? Why don't we just make video conferencing really good? And my answer to that is, it's a little like visiting somebody in prison. Um, you know, even if you had perfect video quality, the fact is there's still this glass wall between you and the other person. You can't, you know, pass anything across that wall like a birthday cake with a file in it or whatever it was supposed to be. So this doesn't really feel like a natural interaction. And now if I add in many more people, it gets even more artificial. So if I have 16 friends I want to interact with, in the real world that's not anything like having 16 tiny little windows with pictures of them. So we really want to be in the same 3D space. <clears throat> so the next thing I thought about was, well, maybe um, like augmented reality. Maybe that's the answer. Uh, what I could imagine is wearing, you know, one of these uh, head-mounted head displays, and I would see the space that I'm in, but I'd also see people projected into my space that weren't really there. And I, I thought for a while that maybe this would be the way to go, but I decided that there were some things that I didn't like about this, even if the video quality was perfect. Uh, one of the things is that these computer-generated things in augmented reality, um, there's nothing physically there. And that's okay if it's an application where you're just trying to add more visual information, like highlight something or add text or something like that. But what we want to do is render everyday objects, like furniture, you know, tables, chairs, and people and all those things. And the problem is, if I walk up here with my coffee mug and I set it down on this table and then discover too late that the table isn't really there and it crashes on the ground, or if I do that with my laptop, or if I try to sit on this chair that's not really there, that'll be uh, unsettling. And I think we wouldn't really like that technology if we we're living in this world where everything is a mirage. So that's the first thing. And you can do some things with haptic feedback, but you can't really solve all these problems with that. Another issue with head-mounted displays is that it's not fun to do them for a very long time because you tend to get motion sickness. So I wanted to do something that didn't involve having any special gear. Um, yeah, and that's the last step. I want to do something where I don't need any special gear. So then our approach to doing this is 
rather than thinking about <clears throat> this as a graphics problem where I've got some model of a 3D object and I'm trying to generate an image to put between your eye and where that thing should be, instead, what we're going to do is just make the object itself. Yeah. Uh -huh. Scott? So I, I hate to ask, but how do we decide that head-mounted goggles are special gear, but Pareo objects are not? <clears throat> oh, it's special gear, definitely. It's just, um, let's see, it's, it's a completely personal, uh, probably not justifiable thing where I don't want to have to remember to bring something with me other than Pario, but that I'm happy to bring with me for some arbitrary reason. <laughs> so. But um, if, I, if I do it this way, if I think about just creating the object rather than an image of the object and interposing it, it actually fixes a lot of problems. First, there's something physically there. If I go up and touch it, you'll feel something. Now, it might be a little surprising when you touch it still because it may look like wood, but it feels like metal or plastic. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm happier with that surprise than you know, having my coffee mug or my laptop shatter on the ground because there's no desk there at all. And also, it solves the problem of um, with virtual reality or augmented reality, you have to there's a little bit of latency. Whenever you move your head quickly, it's hard to update the image right away. But I don't have that problem here. If I move my head, I'm going to see the object in the place where it's supposed to be still. And in fact, you can see it from any viewing angle. And you don't have to recompute it from that particular perspective. So there actually are some things that get more convenient when we could do it this way if we, if we can. <clears throat> now, if we wanted to have um, remote interaction, imagine that I apologize for the primitive clip art here. But imagine that uh, you and two of your friends want to get together and, I guess, aerobicize. Looks like what they're doing here. So the idea is you would first create a conference call, just like you would if you were doing Skype or uh, video conferencing or something like that. So you call everyone up, and they say, OK, I know who you are. Yes, we're going to, make a, we're going to have an interaction here. <clears throat> and then what happens is, using an array of cameras in your space, you will do motion capture and figure out uh, where, where all the objects are, what they look like, and what their shapes are. And then you'll broadcast that to the other rooms, and you'll render objects um, using Claytronics. Now, you have to be careful that there aren't objects in the same space. That's the first thing it'll think about. If there's a collision, it'll say, whoops, you need to move that chair out of the way, or, or these two chairs will be on top of each other. And once you've done that, um, all the physical spaces will be the same in the sense that They'll have the same set of objects in them. Some of them will be real objects, and some of them will be copies of objects. And as anyone moves, as any object moves in one space, its replicas will move in the other spaces. So this will create a very, hopefully, you know, good illusion of actually being in the same space, other than the fact that some things are replicas of things and others are real. Yep? How does that work? If I have a real copy bug in my space, you have a copy in your space, and you move the copy. Well, what would happen is um, the copy of you in my space would move the real mug. So I'm in my space, real me, real mug. Yes. So you're saying copy of you in your space. So yeah. So if we're both would sitting, would actually in, move the real mug. Right. Yeah. 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 That's how. Yeah. Drinking the coffee is another question. Yeah. No. That, that's the one. The one bit obvious limitation is this doesn't work for ingesting things. You don't want to eat food or do that. Everyone needs to bring their own. Uh, you can't. Uh, Go to a restaurant this way, unless we until we create the edible version of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you thought in the intuitions for the creation of the objects about like this becomes economical if you can actually make every single pario the same little thing? Like it, it's literally like sand. Every single one of them is always one thing, and you have a hundred trillion zillion numbers of them. Is that part of it, or are you imagining that there'd be foil versions and? Mm. Like all the different tissues in the body. If it's just all oh, that's that. a really good question. So, and in fact, so our, our goal so far has been to just create one object, and every robot would be identical, with maybe very few exceptions. So some of them maybe can do long-range Wi-Fi, and others can't, or some of them may be batteries, and others aren't, maybe. But we want to have very, very few uh, different types of robots. Hopefully, just one type of robot. Um, and this is actually very different from how nature works. So in, in nature, in biology, there are many different kinds of cells. They specialize into bones and muscles and different things. So one you know, open question is whether, whether the idea of having homogeneous cells 
whether that works, whether we can pull off the behaviors that you see in nature for building like a uh, you know, humanoid object where I have to build a joint and muscles and all that structure. And there are uh, a lot of open questions about that. So we don't really know whether this will work. Our goal is to have one type just for manufacturability, but we don't know if that really works yet. Okay, so assuming that this, we could do this, we could have remote interaction, why would that be useful? Well, um, you wouldn't have to uh, waste time or money traveling from business travel. Um, probably what you would end up doing is every meeting where you might normally just call somebody up will become, uh, and wouldn't necessarily go see them, will become as good as a face-to-face -face meeting perhaps because now they will come over, so to speak. Um, another way that this is interesting is experts, say uh, paramedics, uh, whatever they are, can everybody, a doctor, they can make house calls um, in at least some limited capacity. So you can have a physical presence somewhere else almost immediately. Just like today, I can have a, a voice presence anywhere just by calling somebody up. Now I could have a replica of myself and a replica of that environment where I am uh, almost instantly. And so one reason this might be interesting is for an instant 911 response. You can imagine you call a paramedic um, and the paramedic, you know, you then synchronize your spaces. So the paramedic station and wherever you are become one because you replicate things into both spaces. And now the paramedic can potentially do some things to help you out. Probably not every, you know, everything they could do if they were really there because you can't transport medicine or that type of thing this way. But they could at least maybe do CPR uh, or something like that. There's another question about that because it seems you've thought a lot about the economics of the cario, which would be sort of like play, but the, that scenario requires the camera arrays in every space. What are the economics of that? Well, so. We're hoping that the, um, the material itself can actually contain the camera arrays. So our, our hope would be we'd have little tiny cameras and a whole lot of them because we've got lots of these little things and that that would actually be the way that we would capture the Im information. We don't know yet whether we had good enough uh, video in input from little tiny cameras yet, but that's, that's the goal. Otherwise, if you can't do that, then you can only use this in places where you've set up camera arrays. So you could use it in your home or office, but not outside, probably, unless you carried one with you. So. Oh, and I've got a video of this, but uh, I'll skip over that because uh, it's two minutes long and in the interest of time. Uh, I can do it at the end if you're curious. So, okay, and then now um, another area, well, if you think about consumer electronics and what, you know, what will it mean, for example, to rent something from Netflix if I have Pario at home and not just audio and video? Um, well, in a way, this would be a bit like combining the, the nice aspects of a movie and a play. So you know, I, I rent my movie now, um, and what happens is when I start it up, the actors and the scenery physically materializes in front of me. So it's, it's there. And you could imagine even being you know, in the scene in some sense. You could walk around and actually be in it rather than just being back and seeing it on a screen. So you could potentially have a different angle on, on things. You could also imagine how video game people would take advantage of this. You could uh, imagine video games where you do, you know, the Wii has been very exciting and imagine the Wii you know, taken much further than that. You could not only have some things you could move around, but the, the physical objects in your space could be controlled arbitrarily uh, to do interesting things. Okay, so, oh, that's not what I wanted. There, okay. Okay, yep. Um, I just had a question about, I really think it's a cool idea and you've presented a lot of sort of visionary applications. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about the malicious applications or mm -hmm. what are some of the consequences of having this technology? What are sort of the ethical mm -hmm. considerations? Um, yeah, that, that issue does come up. So um, let's see. At some level, so the, let's see. So for example, you know, prank phone calls, that type of thing. You can now imagine, well, the biggest difference is when if you, you know, in this, because you can control physical things, um, there's now the possibility of someone who's malicious, you know, causing something physical to happen at a remote site. So that could be bad. Um, so that, that's a concern. At some level, um, 
you know, if I can remotely control a robot on the internet somewhere, I have similar problems probably. You know, this has maybe more capabilities than your typical robot. But the thing that we're creating is not some artificially intelligent, you know, sentient object that's going to go wreak havoc on something. It's going to be remotely controlled. So it is, you know, I think that the problems are probably analogous to hacking into a robot somewhere and causing the robot to run around and do bad stuff to first order. And there are a lot of other, this isn't my area of expertise. So there definitely are, security is important because it's not just like cyberspace that people could, you know, do bad things in. It now becomes physical space. So that's, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Prompted by your response, there's a non-AI-ish quality of all this. You talk about mm -hmm. duplicating a person in another place. And if you have the physical ability to do that, you could do fantastic androids that look just like people and do everything if you could control them. Mm -hmm. So are you sort of avoiding the question of how would you control an artificial physical android? Because mm -hmm. you're controlling it by just do, doing mm -hmm. copying. Um, yeah, that isn't something that we're worried about. I mean, in a way, let's see. We're, we're just imagining cases where you're mostly, you know, just having remote control, just like calling somebody, you know, it's my voice and you're just hearing my voice somewhere else. You can synthesize sounds, of course, so you could have synthesized actions or uh, a program that's making something move and it's not really a real person on the other side. So that's all, those are all possibilities. I don't... Are the AI people down the hall saying, yes, build this and we'll use it to build our AI creatures? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, I don't... I mean, yes, there isn't anything special about this that I think makes it better for AI than an, another robot, as, as far as I know. It's more fluid, but it's, I don't know. Yes. Uh -huh. How small will these scale over the next 10 or 15 years? Well, I think, that, uh, I think that if we get it to about a millimeter, we have a design now to make it work at a millimeter. In fact, the, the well, I'll put these over here. Well, I don't know if you can see those or not. These are really small. But we, we have like half millimeter hemispheres in here. When you start using MEMS and photolithography, it's easy to jump down to a millimeter. And I don't actually, it's not clear to me that we need them to be a whole lot smaller than that. Um, because, I mean, to get a lot of the applications working that I talked about, I think a millimeter physical resolution is probably good enough, especially if you can have a higher video resolution than that on top of it. It'll be like, you know, the first televisions where you can recognize what you see and later we move to say high def TV. So these things might get smaller over time, but I don't think we really ever need them to be, you know, nanometer in diameter. I don't think there's necessarily, it's like, ha you know, there's a point where having more pixels in your camera just doesn't make it look more realistic because our eyes just don't see any more detail beyond that point. So, you know, a bit smaller than a millimeter, but I don't think they ever really need to be super small, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to me that you address with the more advanced application something that trying to simulate reality, uh -huh. um, which has other technology that you address that you kind of try to show the pro and con of the technology, uh -huh. and you're kind of ignoring the fact that they are advancing too, and uh -huh. what I would call sensography eventually can be maybe more efficient. You are not addressing the issue of using the technology for something that no, there is no other application. For example, if we have a meeting in a room, mm -hmm. and there are 10 people and only five chairs, but there are too many desks, I'd like the de some of the desks to morph themselves into chairs. Right. So there are enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah. something that other things cannot do. Right, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, as I said, so, like, the remote interaction is just one of, like, five classes of applications, I think, that I covered. Like, early on, yeah, when I talked about, you know, yeah, you know, like you just said, you know, the fact that things might be able to just change shape would be really useful, certainly in mobile applications. Um, if I can only carry a little bit of stuff with me, I want it to be as useful as possible, or I want, you know, tables and chairs to reconfigure themselves potentially. And in a way, you could imagine, one person said when they heard about this, you can imagine that when you're born, you're just given, you know, like a, you know, a bushel basket of this material, and you could kind of use it for almost anything you know, through the rest of your life. Because this thing could be, it's like the universal material almost. It could be, you know, <laughs> so many different things. So it's a very 
uh, well, other than consuming ener the consuming energy part, it's a sort of green friendly technology, I guess. But I'll have to address that part. Yeah. Or I, I don't know if I'm. I mean, yeah, I mean, self repairing vehicle. So at least you are able, once you, you get a flat tire, you are able to continue the, uh, along the road or some other thing like this. Uh, yes. Question. Anybody doing any calculations on uh, physical integrity and strength? I mean, it's <laughs> nice to be able to form a chair, but I'm not sure you'd want to sit on it. Yeah, so we've done a lot of back of the envelope things, but we, well, so if I back up here a bit, it depends a lot on just in these two designs here. Okay, so one of the designs is this, where I'm, you know, rolling, uh, you know, something into a 3D shape, but this is, uh, whoops, if we can go to the PowerPoint. If we can switch to the PowerPoint, great. So this thing uh, is probably very springy and not necessarily very strong. Um, the fact that it's light will make it nice and easy to move it around. But if I sat on a chair built out of these, it might collapse or compress. In this design here, what we're doing is actually filling these molds with glass. So this is a very rigid, this would be a hard object. So you can imagine, assuming they can hold it assuming they can exert the forces to hold together, that this would have more you know, strength in terms of me sitting on it. But we, don't, we won't really know until we build, build these things in terms of how strong they are. We... Yes, Scott? Do you have a sense of what application is going to be the thin end of the wedge for these? So I very much buy the eventual story. I'm curious, what's going to be the first app that we use this technology for in your mind? Yeah, I think... It is uh, this. I think I think it's the medical space because uh, I think that there's a lot of value in having. In fact, I think generally it's it's interactive three D physical modeling because that's a space where the physical resolution it's so it's such a new capability compared to what we have now that I'd probably be willing to tolerate low fidelity. And I think that in the medical space, this is something where they buy, you know, people spend a lot on medical instruments. And you could imagine having, you know, some of these things in a hospital, uh, even if the individual units were sort of pricey. So I think that, that that's probably the space where it'll start. And so then in a sense here, your competition very much is the desktop VR plus haptic feedback setup. Right. right. Yeah, I think so. It strikes me as it's some kind of like a physical, like Uber oven mitten. Like instead of going and uh, doing CPR on someone remotely, which would probably be kind of a far out, not thin engine. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody might be one of these avatars. So you'd be repairing the other guy's avatar. Like nobody ever leave their home anymore in your theory. So you, these avatars would be the things that'd be interacting with other avatars. You'd mm -hmm. want to move the environment around inside of their kind of well videographed space. Mm -hmm. So it's more like in a video game where you are an avatar and you go out and hang out with other avatars. So I'm saying, so you got this springy one locally and you learn martial arts because it doesn't really hurt. Uh -huh. And the high impact glass ones are fighting somewhere else where it would know what would happen. Uh -huh. So it's some kind of, kind of oven mitten where you have a physical surrogate. Uh -huh. The actual interaction between flesh and these sort of is much creepier than <coughs> interactions with you know 3D models on some level because they're not the same the same kind of uncanny quality that's with video would be almost worse in the same way it yeah it. yeah i mean it would be you know a physical princess leia thing from star wars it would still look like it'd be glowing and it wouldn't really look like a real person but it wouldn't but be they a interact with each other right that's they're true. all of the same like yeah. an avatar yeah my, my personal preference i wanted to have a technology where to, to as much as possible i wanted it to seem like the natural world that's why I, you know some people have told me that their dream would be to, you know, be able to completely override all of your senses, you know, your vision, everything, maybe directly plug into your brain or something, so you could experience these vivid experiences. And you know, that's that wasn't the direction I want to go in. So I'm I'm trying to build something where it would make sense for this to seem very much like the normal physical world, and we can maybe just augment the little pieces of it that we want to. But I'm, I'm personally not aiming for something where everything is just cyber and nothing is real. So, but it, that may be just my own preference. Everyone else might want to stay home and never get dressed when they wake up in the morning or whatever. But. So, and then I had, uh, sorry, 
I actually <laughs> this one last slide. So just to recap, uh, for HCI types of things, I think that it's the, uh, this 3D modeling part is what really interests me because you can use this not only you know, as a display but as an input device because you can grab it and move it and mold it. And I think my intuition is there are probably exciting things we can do with that. And it, it's shocking in a way that we still use the keyboard, mouse, and screen uh, paradigm you know, 30 years or whatever after it was been invented 40 or something. So, yes? Uh, from, from that application point of view, from modeling, can, it, can you put into it some other laws of physics other than capturing space? <coughs> so you don't just use it as clay to represent a car, but also to represent electricity or heat or yeah. other kind of uh, feature that you want from a model. Yeah, I think that's the, the value, real value added from it is, well, one value is um, when I manipulate it, it knows what I'm doing and it captures it. It's just sort of a small version of 3D capture. But I think the real value is when it can understand design rules or simulate physics or do other simulations so that when I'm manipulating it, it's actually responding in an intelligent way and that that interactively live. I think that that's what would make it very interesting. So sort of the protein folding example. If I had a protein and I just grabbed it and I started bending it and it was pushing back on me using the forces that you would see at that molecular level, you know, that wouldn't be what I would normally see in a physical model, but that might be where it'd be especially useful. Okay, thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.